Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, creative content writer here in Chesterfield, and very glad to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is on the air once again. Um, hard to believe it, but the school year is right around the corner. Summer's almost over. Um, the school year will be here before you know it. And we thought it would be a good opportunity today to talk a little bit about maybe helping you as parents getting ready for that school year, maybe giving you some tips and some strategies and some things that you can kind of think of to prepare your students for a successful school year. I want to welcome in first Valerie Folks from uh, Mental Health Support Services. Uh, Valerie, how are you? Welcome to the show. Good morning. I am great, Brad. Glad Thank you very much for joining us today. Obviously, there's a, a lot that goes into how to pre- prepare your kid for school. And I think for a lot of parents out there, you know, myself included, the idea of another school year, it seems like it just ended. You know, it, feel, this was, it feels like a very short summer. Um, but at the same time, I think you're always mindful that there, if there can be any sort of help, any sort of anything we can do better to sort of pre- prepare for that, the better it is. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about sort of your experience and how it is that you kind of came to be here today. What, what, what kind of brought you into this field and, and what's, your, what's your kind of background with prevention and things like that? Perfect. So my background with children and families, it's been about seven years with the experience of family and children. I've been with prevention services for about 18 months. Okay. And how I came to be a part of prevention services is that with my background with families and children, I felt like a part of me wanted to do more. And that was to provide um, more support for the total comprehensive family. Um, my background is in education with right. children. Okay. So I have that, and I just wanted to expand that even further and provide my service to the support of the family at whole. So yeah. that's how I came to be a part cool. of prevention services. So let's start with a kind of a big picture question. Mm-hmm. Um, if, 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 as, as parents are getting ready for the school year, what, what kind of tips and strategies can you kind of generally offer for ways to kind of set their kids up for a successful school year? What kind of things do you, what kind of tips and strategies do you, do you think would work for that? So my motto is to keep it practical, keep it simple. So okay. the first thing I would say is to just plan ahead. Okay. As you stated earlier, like we just felt like they were out of school like a couple <laughs> of months ago, a month ago, right? Right, it So does. now they're headed back. So prepare for that. Plan ahead for the school year. It right. is now August the 1st. So right. start planning ahead with their schedule, determine what their schedule is going to look like, Right. right? Also create that routine. Mm-hmm. So at some point, um, it should be mindful just to start preparing that bedtime, that morning routine, mm-hmm. what that would look like, preparing for getting out of the house, right. rushing out of the house for school, and also bedtime. Like, what does your nighttime routine look like? Mm-hmm. Another thing is communication is so important. Yeah, for sure. Keep those lines of communication open with your child. Also keep that, you know, with communication, you got to be mindful of that it matters on the delivery. Right. So that soft tone, that soft tone, um, soft approach goes a lot further than, you know, the other approach of frustration. <laughs> right. And I right. know we have our moments as parents. Right. Yeah. Um, but generally the the communication matters over soft tone and approach yep. really where it makes yeah. a difference. Another tip I would say is to be involved. Yeah. You know, be right. involved without hovering. Right. And it's so hard to do that as parents because we want to make sure that, you know, they have everything they need. We want to make sure that they're successful. So stay involved, you know, show up for their activities at school if they're in activities. Right. Right. Um, Talk to their teachers. Parent teacher conferences are happening, you know, back to school night. Right. Get involved in your child's education Mm -hmm. so you can be prepared if something happens or comes up. You know exactly what's going on and how, you know, to put a plan in action to resolve that. Yeah. Another thing I would say is schedule time for homework, schedule time for study time. Right. So with the younger babies, the younger children, there are may not be homework, right? Mm-hmm. But there may be something that you can implement, like yeah. implement reading time for 20 minutes a day, right? right? Homework time. And also all of this varies depending on the child. Right. The age yeah, child, for sure. Yeah. Right. So what you may create a routine for a younger child, you may not necessarily do that right. routine at 20. Right. Yeah. So just keep in mind that whatever plan of action that you have that you keep in mind, the age of child does make a difference in how you set that, create that routine um, and be involved in their education. And I can imagine too, you know, from, from your point of view that the best thing that a kid can have is consistency. Right. And so whether we're talking about, you know, whatever that consistency might be in in this specific arena, right. The idea of, you know, you're talking about like without hovering, right. If you're consistently involved, you know, and that might be like you mentioned homework, Mm -hmm. You know, I can imagine that if you're 
if your parents are involved, you know, consistently with your homework, then it doesn't come across as like this, like almost punishment kind of thing. What are some tips and, and strategies that folks, you know, how, sh- how involved should parents be in homework, I guess is a good yes. way to phrase it. So of course, varies depending on the teenager. Right, right? for sure. Var- varies depending on the child. So you want to make sure that you meet them where they are, most importantly, right? Mm-hmm. So you monitor their progress over time. And yeah. homework starts off, it's better to actually implement a homework study time and be involved early on in the academic school year, mm-hmm. right? Because like you said, it's easier to become more consistent when you start off being consistent versus when you let time go by and there's like, oh my God, they're not doing so well right. in school. How do right. I respond to that? Right. All right. So you want to make sure that you pay attention to their grades, right? right? I know Chesterfield County has like a parent view system where you can check in on your students, your child's Mm -hmm, grades. mm -hmm. Also show up for show up for them. Right. Mm -hmm. If you feel like if they're coming to you saying, hey, I need help in a particular serve. I'm sorry, a particular subject that, you know, you are trying to do your part to help them be successful Uh and providing that support. Right. You know. Yeah. And and in terms of, you know, consistency can't you can't be consistent enough in some ways, especially when it comes to kids because they they key off that so much if there's anything i've learned in the eight years i've been a dad that's the that's the thing right Mm -hmm. and in terms of you you mentioned earlier patterns right Mm -hmm. setting those um having those um plans in place those expectations Mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about sleep you mentioned it uh, you know having a good bedtime routine i'm just curious what is a good bedtime routine for uh for a kid or or a teen even what are what are some of the um the sort of uh best practices in in your opinion in terms of how how kids should go to sleep and what kind of sleep they should be getting yes so we would love for you guys to understand that a shutdown sequence or shutdown routine Mm -hmm. makes a huge difference in that bedtime sequence okay what it looks like so there's no more than like maybe three or four activities that you will give your your child um to prepare them for the next day so for example that would look like for a younger child they will that will look like more so uh have them brush their teeth right Mm -hmm. something simple brushing teeth that you know giving them a bad time mm-hmm. um also um reading them a book at night or right. having that conversation right. bonding town time, time with your child mm-hmm. is very very important right mm-hmm. so this bedtime sequence of routine should be no more than 30 minutes right? Right. right so i mentioned your younger kids but over time you will want to gradually gradually uh increase that okay and allow your child to develop their own sequence their own, right mm-hmm, and to make sure that they are you giving them the opportunity to create that and implement that bedtime right. on their own so there's practical things what are some things that you know need to get done need to get done right the night before they uh, you know go to school those mm-hmm. are the things that should be included in the bedtime routine gotcha the shutdown sequence and unplug yeah they it's so important guys that you unplug so we're talking about at least an hour before bedtime yeah. no screen time no electronics right. right no tv just allow their brains to be able to shut down right. and prepare for that sleep right and to have the best you know amount and quality of sleep that they can best yeah. you know possibly have you you kind of you kind of stole my next question because i was actually just thinking in terms of you know sh- your shutdown routine right so the idea that a kid you know, has a natural sort of, you know, things that they want to do at night, you know, their brains need to kind of come down. I can imagine that you're probably going to tell me that it's best as you just did a little bit, right? So the idea of like screens have become such a bigger part Mm -hmm. of lives. And I think for a lot of parents, we struggle, right? We struggle on how much they're supposed to be on. Is it, is it okay if it's educational? Is it not okay if it's educational? Um, I'm just curious in terms of what you, what research and, and that kind of thing says about screen time, how much is too much? Where, what should, what sort of balance should there be? Certainly at night, there's a, you know, obviously a very different sort of mint, uh, kind of, uh, situation around that. I'm just curious in terms of screen time, what should parents know and what should they be, what kind of practices should they be, uh, involved in when that, when it comes to that? Absolutely. So screen time, um, for parents just should be done in moderation, right? Okay. So the first question you should ask yourself relating to screen time with your child is, are they mature enough to handle mm, okay. the media use, yeah, right? right? That's the first step to determine that. Are they, a, is it age appropriate, okay, right? right? Are they mature enough? And also set those self safety precautions, right? Yeah. right? 
be be monitor what they're watching, right? right? Um, it's unrealistic to say that with technology and everything that's going on that uh, you should not allow your right. child access to <laughs> screen right. time. Yeah. Because whether or not you do it at home or not, right. they are in school using screen time right. at some point. True. Educational content, right? right? Yeah. So also to be mindful that although that certain apps or things mm-hmm. that says that it's educational content, do your research and make sure that when it's saying that it's education, that, that it actually, actually is, is right? educational. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Because not all content is equal, right? Yeah, that's not, right. Not everything, just because the state says education, is not education. That's right? true. Yeah. So then set the boundaries, right? Limit that screen time. So it is recommended that children should not have any more access than two hours a day okay. per, during the week right. uh, for screen time. Um, just because so it can give their brains enough time. You, you don't want them to neglect right. social interaction. Right. Right? Yeah. You want them to be able to have active movement, you right. know, be able to have proper amounts of sleep and right. also give them time to do their homework and study time. Right. That's true. So I would say my motto is just to limit, moderate, you know, mm-hmm. moderation a screen time makes a big difference. And of course, you know, we have pros and cons of everything. So as a parent, you would touch that base on your personal values, right? Mm -hmm. Your educational um, expectation goes for your child. Just monitor and make sure that they are actually seeking appropriate content. And then sometimes why not just go ahead and just be a part of that experience, that screen time experience and do an activity with them. Something they love to do, right? right? Which kind of goes back to what we talked about, you know, involvement and consistency. Yes, be involved, be be consistent, set the expectation for the amount of screen time that you're going to allow. I would say the earlier and the younger that you set the expectation as a parent, you know, the more easier it would get when they become a teen. Because when they become a teen, the exposure (laughs) is everywhere. That's true. Right. That's right. Um, So if you set that expectation, be consistent and model the screen time that you wish to see in your family. For example, you set limitations on screen time. Right. When we eat as a family, no 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 phones are allowed. No devices. Right. No phones, no anything. As a family, that's our dinner time, right? right? Or if we're watching a movie together as a family, no lim- limitations, right? Set right. limitations. No phones are allowed. Right. We are spending quality bonding time with our our family. So right. just set that. It's okay to set limitations. Right. It's okay to set boundaries. It's okay to moderate right. what your child's screen time looks like cool. if you feel like it's going to you know hinder their ac- educational. Good deal. Um, success. Well, Valerie, thank you very much for joining the podcast. I really appreciate you coming on. All right. Thank you for having me. We're now joined by Ginger Dotter, who is also with Mental Health Support Services. Ginger, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Very glad to have you. Obviously, you know, in our conversation that Valerie and I were having, we we're talking a lot about sort of the um, consistency that, that kids need, especially, you know, going into a new school year, trying to get off on the right foot. Maybe parents out there trying to maybe change some of the things that maybe they've done in the past or trying to, you know, use some of these tips and strategies. Before we get started and talk a little bit about sort of you, your your uh, areas of expertise and stuff, I'm actually curious to kind of get a sense of your role, right, what your background is and how you kind of came to, to work where you work and do what you do. Well, um, when I was growing up, I always loved to help people and things like that. So, um, and I found that like in my teenage years, there were a lot of my friends would seek me out to like talk to about problems and things okay. like that. Right. And then when I went to college, I became very fascinated with psychology, like how the mind works okay. and human behavior. And, and then I kind of dabbled in some counseling classes okay. and, um, that's where I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. Okay. So I became a child and adolescent therapist. Okay. And, um, and then after a few years, I stumbled upon this field called prevention. Right. And um, basically the rest is history. That was like 20 <laughs> years ago. And here I am. <laughs> I like that. And the, and the rest is history. That's that's good. Um, I want to talk a little bit about first with, with you about sort of parental involvement, right? You know, Valerie and I talked a little bit about sort of the idea of that, you know, being a hover parent, you know, you can't necessarily just be involved only in the moments when it's like critical that you're involved. You sort of need to be involved across the board. In in terms of parental involvement, what sort of um, like how how do you think that plays a role in a child's you know whether it's development or just in general you know, getting off into the start of a school year and being able to make the most of their academic endeavors? What, what role does parental involvement play in that? You think? Well, first of all, I think it's important to know that parental involvement is like the main. Um, 
the main part of a student's success. So without that, you know, it makes it less likely they're going to be extremely successful right, in school. Right. So, but the great thing is there's many different ways to become involved. I think a lot of parents are like, well, what about my work schedule? I can't mm. just be taken off work, things like yeah, that. Right. So um, one is supporting the learning, mm-hmm. you know, help your child, you know, um, find that love or that motivation for learning. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you can attend different events um, as they come up, whether it's a classroom performance right. or even going on field trips, things right. like that. So um, there's many different ways to um, to be involved. And so, like, you know, if they want to be involved, like, in the school in general, mm-hmm. you know, the PTA, PTO meetings. Right. But it's super important to meet the teacher, you okay. know, go to the open houses, right. you know, right. back to school nights, things like that. And not only meet them then and for those parent-teacher conferences, but communicate with them throughout the year. Right. You know, keep a pulse on, you know, what's going well and where's my – child need, you know, a little bit of assistance, you know, how can, and how can I support them at home with this? Yeah. Cause it would seem like it would be a lot easier for you to sort of see the speed bumps coming Mm -hmm. if you've been watching the road for a while. Right. right? And I can imagine that that's especially important for when your kids are a little older, Mm -hmm. because there's so much that goes into their, their daily lives that you're just not privy to, like you're not Mm -hmm. around, right? Because, you know, the conversations they're having with friends, how much, you know, how much these conversations impact them and that kind of thing. I can imagine that the more involved you are, the better it is for your kid, especially, you know, as they go forward. And is that sort of been your experience? Absolutely. And also the more involved you are, we're not saying it's a good thing to be a helicopter parent, right, but right. Um, but the more involved we are, the more we have that open communication with them, right. then it makes it easier for us to see when there is some trouble, like right. you were talking about. So um, so it's really important along the way. Yeah. Now, in, in terms of um, behavior, we, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously mindful that you know, it's good for parents to be involved, but there's also the, the possibility that like you, you could find your kid sort of your, your, your student getting in trouble at school and it just doesn't match what you see on a day to day basis. Right. That there's something that happens to them or something that goes on with them there versus the way they are at home. And I'm curious, how, how can parents best deal with that, whether it's a younger child, a teenager, you know, all points in between? I'm just curious what, what sort of tips and strategies ideas do you have for parents who might, whose whose children might be getting in trouble at school, but they just aren't like that at home? What's the best way for them to to sort of help in those situations? That can be such a big struggle too, because it's like you're relying on someone else's Mm -hmm. perception, their opinions perhaps, right? Right. and you're not seeing this behavior. So it's like, well, how am I supposed to deal with something that I don't even know exactly what it looks like? Right. Yeah. So again, I would ask questions, ask the teacher, any of the staff, at um, the school that's involved, you know, maybe it's the principal, assistant principal, Mm -hmm. maybe the counselor, you know, ask them, you Mm -hmm. know, so tell me more about what's going on and what can I do to be helpful? Because sometimes we just don't know what to do, especially if we're not seeing that behavior at home. Right. So I I think it's really important to, to um, make sure that even if we don't see it, that we are still like on board with, you know, hey, I'll do what I can to to help with this at home. So it goes back to that structure and the routines, Mm -hmm. you know, having those expectations set out, and making sure that we keep those boundaries set, um, mm-hmm. to, you know, with them. Yeah. And we mentioned, you know, behavior a second ago, and I'm just curious too, from a mental health sort of standpoint, it feels like nowadays, you know, kids are probably in, inundated from all sides in, in things that can impact their mental health and, and their behaviors. And I'm just curious, you know, what, it, what should parents sort of be looking for when it comes to mental health and, 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 that, and behaviors and that kind of thing? What, what should folks be on the lookout for? Um, sort of you know, on a day-to-day basis? Well, you know, that's, um, there's a lot we could say about that. Yeah. Um, there's so much, but um, but just to kind of sum that up, it's it's like, you know, parents are the experts on their children right. and their teens. And so one, when you see some major changes in them, you know, really zoom in and have conversations with them and right. try to find out what's going on underneath. Right. Um, but what we know is that certainly, you know, even as adults, when we experience, you um, like stress, especially if it's chronic, like Mm -hmm. the last few years. Yeah, for sure. Um, We all have different ways of handling that. And it can affect us like, you know, it can make us really tired, exhausted, you know, different things like that. So with kids, some of that's going to be the same and some might be different. But some of the things to look, you know, um, to look at is, you know, are their behaviors really getting like out of control? Are they losing, um, you know, their temper a lot? Right. Right. Um, are they out of their seat, not complying with what the teachers are saying? And this is totally a new thing for them. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if they're losing interest in things that they usually 
have an interest in, mm-hmm. that's that's a sign. Um, that could be something like depression, um, things like that. And and sometimes, unfortunately, people will become depressed when they right. have that chronic stress. Right. And even um, last year, last fall, the American Academy of Pediatrics, among other organizations, declared a state of emergency mm. for youth mental health because the numbers have gone up so much during COVID. Right. And so, um, you know, again, you know, be aware of what those signs and symptoms right. are. Depression and anxiety and suicidal behaviors are definitely like um, increasing, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And so, like, if someone um, is, if they say something about "I wish I wasn't here anymore" right. or say things like "I would, I wish I could just die," really take that seriously. Right. Um, I know we don't want to believe that's true that they would really think about suicide. Right. Right. But let a professional figure it out, right? And um, so get them, you know, some kind of help with with that, right? There's lots of different avenues for it, right? One thing too, I was just thinking of is, you know, the idea of of self care, right? Mm-hmm. That, yeah, you know, we can focus so much on our kids, and we can certainly focus on their behavior and stuff, but we should probably be teaching them too the opportunities to look for those chances for them to, to take care of themselves, yeah. right? And heck, we probably should do some of that ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Uh, how important do you think self-care is both for, for kids and as parents alike? Oh, it's really essential. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, if we're only going to take care of ourselves once something really big has happened, right. it makes it harder to um, practice it, yeah. to, you know, to start trying to do this on a daily basis mm-hmm. for it to become a habit. Right. But if we already have it as a habit before something large happens, then it's just a lot easier just to kind of continue on with our self-care and, mm-hmm. and it helps us be more resilient. Right. So with self-care for parents, it's absolutely necessary. So a lot of parents are like, I just don't have time for this or that. Right. However, if they can take five or 10 minutes here and there for themselves, whether right. it's just to do some mindfulness. Every little um, bit helps, right? Right. You got to start somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. And then I can imagine too, like the idea of like, I was just thinking as you were talking, you know, it's, you know, if it rains, right, if you don't have an umbrella, Mm -hmm. right, when you're already in the middle of the downpour, it's too late to find the umbrella, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And I can imagine for a lot of parents, you know, that's exactly the situation they can find themselves in if they're not careful. I'm just curious, what kind of services do you guys have for folks who might have any of the, you know, questions about any of this sort of stuff? That we've talked about today, what kind of um, what kind of opportunities are out there for people? Well, first of all, so I do work for Chesterfield Mental Health Support Services, and I work in a department called Prevention. So in right. our department, we have some things like parent consultation and parenting classes that could help folks that are wanting to know more about you know what can they do for their children, right. like how can they kind of rein in some of these behaviors and things like right. that. Um, also, like if someone thought, you know, their child might need counseling, there's a mm-hmm. lot of different avenues for that. Mm-hmm. Um, at Mental Health Support Services, um, they could contact our intake department to find out what are the hours that they can walk in or they can make an appointment, especially if they're Spanish speakers, okay. to make sure that they have someone available and it'll reduce their waiting time if they do schedule an appointment. Um, they can find out also what kind of paperwork is needed um, to bring with them, like mm-hmm. insurance and identification, things like that. So, or they could call um, 804-768-7318. Okay. That's the um, intake number. Um, for people that have insurance, they can check, um, you know, to see who um, is covered on okay. the insurance plan. Right. Then um, if they're really concerned and they're concerned their child or someone else is um, in crisis, like right. they're thinking about suicide or just really, really super overwhelmed at that moment, they could um, certainly contact our crisis line, which okay. is 24-7. Okay. And that's 804, um, let's see, 804-748-6356. Okay. And of course, there's always the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. And it just changed yeah. to 988. So you yep. don't have to dial that 1 800 273 talk anymore. You can just dial 988 to get to them. Good deal. Mm-hmm. Well, Ginger, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and, and talking to us about all of these very important topics. And, and hopefully, folks, if they need those, those services and they need to talk to you guys, that they certainly do. But really appreciate you being here. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Make sure you check us out on social media. On Twitter, it's at Chesterville VA. And on Instagram, it's Chesterville Virginia, all one word. And on Facebook, you can check out our podcast page. Just search Chesterville behind the mic. Make sure to like that page so you can keep up with us as we go forward. Now, let me tell you about all the ways you can check us out. You can watch us on our YouTube channel as well as on our website at Chesterfield.gov slash podcast. An audio-only version of the show is available there as well as on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, 
and a whole host of other services. You can also watch the show on WCCT Thursday through Sunday at 7, and on the weekends at noon, that's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. And lastly, you can check out chesterfield.gov slash connect with us for more ways for you to get in touch with us and for us to get in touch with you. My thanks to my director, Martin Stiff, and all the good folks here in communications and media for making this possible. And my thanks to you for checking us out today. So from all of us here in Chesterfield, thank you very much for making us a part of your day. We'll see you again real soon. Take good care.